hey, how can we do something together? It's a, a longer term mindset, not a what can I get, get you in, get you out, move on to the next person. And I'd say like the biggest difference is being people centric and value based. And of course, having a longer term vision that this is a relationship that you're building. You are listening to Amplify Your Success Podcast, episode 379. And today I've got a special guest joining me to talk about how to grow your list by hosting virtual summits. You ready for this? Let's get started. Welcome to the Amplify Your Success Podcast. Get ready to ramp up your revenue, amplify your impact, and make your mark in the world. This is the show for experts, thought leaders, and service professionals who want to shatter their limits and achieve that next level, you're going to find out from other experts and influencers how they made it. Now, let's get amplified. Hey there, entrepreneurs and business leaders. It's your host, Melanie Benson, authority amplifier to expert-based entrepreneurs who are ready to achieve five and six-figure months consistently. And today, we're going to talk about something that is, this is just one of my favorite strategies You know, I'm all about using the microphone to attract ideal clients, whether it's a podcast or a stage or virtual events. And I, my friend that's joining us today is going to talk about how he started hosting virtual summits and what happened to the growth of his list. But there's also a second payoff here. And I talk a lot about this in all of my programs because I'm a huge believer in collaboration That's how my guest ended up here today. That's how I ended up on his stages. And you will start to see that relationships with other people who are taking bold action and leading their own events, whether it's uh, stages, it's uh, workshops, it's webinars, whatever it is, podcasts, there is something that moves the needle at an exponential rate when you are the person who takes the lead. And this is a big part of generating million dollar visibility. And if you don't yet have my seven step framework to generate million dollar visibility for your business and activate these extraordinary kinds of, well, literally they're just, they're friendships. They are relationships with other people who you share value systems, you share audiences, and you know that co-creating success together is not only more effective, but it's also more joyful and fun. And my guest today is an extraordinary example of that and what his strategy that he lays out for you is brilliant. So listen in, but before you do, head over right now to amplifywithmelanie.com and download my seven step framework. And when you do so, watch for an invitation to my live masterclass where I'll teach you how to put your seven step framework together and generate whether you want a six figure boost or you wanna hit million dollar revenue and make a greater impact in the process, this is the strategy that works. Now, I don't wanna wait another minute, let me bring on our special guest. Welcome back, Amplifiers. Today, we're talking about virtual summits and how they are continuing to be a proven strategy to consistently add 1,000, 1,500 great clients to your email list. Let me introduce my friend, Jay Williams. Now, Jay is an international speaker and a high-performance coach. He's helped over 500 driven entrepreneurs from startups all the way to seven figures to conquer self-doubt, worry, and procrastination by uncovering and removing blocks that hold them back, leading to massive business growth. Now, Jay is masterfully hosting so many virtual summits. That's how we met. He's been specializing in AI. He's a just an aficionado around mindset. We can we can jam on mindset for for hours. And I knew that he could bring some great wisdom in real time to you so that you can bring a strategy like virtual summits into your business. So Jay, thanks so much for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. And it was it was a pleasure to be able to have you on one of my virtual summits. You too are a, a wealth of knowledge and I'm sure your listeners can attest to that as well. So it's great to uh, be on the other side of the microphone this time around. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's always fun to... Uh, 
um, shift the microphone position with me with somebody who's used to doing all the interviews. Uh, so enjoy, enjoy the ride today. I'll do my best. Well, you you have you have so much that you are masterful at. And you have a lot of experience. I would love to just kind of like kind of lean into like, why did you start running virtual summits as part of your business model? Yeah, good question. It's it's something that I kind of fell into, much like uh, the same with my coaching. I actually, I, I'd taken my business to uh, a certain level. I got my business to six figures. And I was at a place where, um, I was getting the majority of my clients through social media, Facebook specifically. So I'd built a following, I built an audience. And then one morning I woke up and I had a message from my assistant, which said, Jay, um, I can't get into your Facebook account. And I'm thinking, oh, she's forgot a password or something. So what do you mean? She said, oh, well, it says it's been shut down. And I'm thinking, okay. <laughs> do to stay calm everything will be okay and i'm the optimist right i'm just like well what can we do how do we figure this out so i thought oh it's just obviously some kind of misunderstanding or mistake so i go to log in and yes i've been shut down so i go to review and i go through facebook's review process which is arduous and a bit of a pain in the backside and you can't speak to a human being to explain that this thing has happened and it's clearly a misunderstanding so i appeal the decision and then uh two days later i get a message from facebook which says dear mr williams we've reviewed your appeal and unfortunately uh, our decision has finally decided to shut down your account please do not respond to this email because we will not respond our decision is final i'm like <laughs> You can imagine what just came out of my mouth. <laughs> wow. What do we do here? Now, what happened is I lost my ability to generate income overnight because at the time I had an email list of about 600 people. And those 600 people were just, it, it wasn't something that I particularly focused on. And so now I was in a position where I thought to myself, well, I don't have an email list. I don't have a social media following. I don't have all of the names of all of these people that I've been nurturing. And I probably had about probably in the realm of $150,000, $200,000 in uh, future revenue just sat there that I'd been nurturing and working on. And I didn't have all of that information. And I realized in that moment, wow. I've put my business massively at risk here. And more importantly, my revenue, and my ability to earn. And so what that re really led me to start thinking about is, okay, I never want to put my business at risk again. That's not to say I don't use social media anymore because I do. I'm back on. But I also need to make sure that I have control of my ability to generate an income. And so I started looking into, well, how do I build my email list? Now, I'd done a program probably two years earlier, which give me like the bare bones of how to do a virtual summit and I'd gone through this thing and I'd put on a virtual summit. Now at the time I had only, I'd reached out to 500 potential speakers to get on my show and I only managed to get 13 on there. I generated a whopping 113 leads for that summit and a, a, an even bigger zero sales from that particular <laughs> summit. <laughs> so it's safe to say when I thought about doing this strategy again, I had to question whether I was losing my mind because the first one had been such a big failure. But instead of, and it's not really me to kind of give up on things too easily, uh, instead of just going, okay, I can't do this, I realized it was a it was a strategy that lends itself nicely to my skill set and where I enjoy spending my time, which is with people in a live audience adding value. And so that's where um, I decided to start running virtual summits again. Mm, I love it. It's such a great story, too, because I think um, when you know there is a strategy that could work, oftentimes we go through a learning curve to make it work. <laughs> and yeah. I, and I, and I appreciate that you, you brought into the conversation, like, Hey, my first one out of the gate was not the the biggest ROI maker for me. And I, and I think that is a perspective we have to keep in mind. 
uh, when you are learning things on your own, you're going to make a lot of mistakes, missteps. You're not always going to get it right out of the gate. And sometimes it takes a few reiterations before you do it. And and then, you know, there's the strategy of hiring someone who knows what they're doing to shorten a lot of those learning curves. But thank you for being so truthful about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, let's let's actually kind of dig into that a little bit more because, you know, you and I've been around the block quite a few times. I've probably been on a couple hundred summits over the years, and some of them have been fantastic. I think there are some people that are just, and yours, you know, you definitely have a really powerful approach to putting on good virtual summits. And then some of them, you're like, <clears throat> okay, that did not really perform well, didn't really get a much out of it. And, you know, there's not necessarily a lot for the speakers out of it. Or I also hear sometimes from participants, they're not getting a lot of it. What do you think is the soup, the, like the special sauce that makes a virtual summit? not just powerful for the person hosting it, but for the attendees as well as the other speakers? Yeah, that's a really great question. And I've stumbled across my fair share of summit builders, let's call them that, that who their intention, and I'm not saying this is bad, right? It's just one way of doing it. Their intention is really build the email list and make money. That That's what they lead with. Now, what I find is I'm a people centric person. I love people. I love helping people. So for me, it's very much not around let's lead with what can I get, but what can I give? And so when I'm showing up, when I'm thinking about my speakers, I'm really thinking like, how can this person really add value to my audience? I'm not thinking, oh, let's hear how big Melanie's list is, right? Let's let let's see how I can use her to my advantage. It's really not that approach. It's more about collaboration. Mm -hmm. And so I think the big difference in um, what creates a really great summit is what your intention is behind the summit. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, no, I never want to generate leads. I never want we're all in business, right? So we need to be smart about that. I think it's just first and foremost, how you lead it. And for me, I, I've i heard from a number of people who've spoken on summits that the host didn't even take the time to get on the phone with them for like 10, 15 minutes to get to know them. Now, I would never put someone on my stage if I hadn't had some kind of conversation. I just wouldn't, right? That's an example of the First type of person that's just like, hey, have you got a list? Uh, you know, are you credible? Are you... And let's bang out the numbers. They're playing the numbers game. I'm not playing the numbers game. I'm playing a people game. And I think that's one of the things that makes the big difference. And how that shows up from a, how do I enhance it for the speakers? I'm always thinking to myself, how can I help this speaker to get more leads? Because, hey, Yes, many of my speakers come on and they just want to add value. They just want to contribute. But also, they also have a business. So how can I make them win? So for example, I've got a, a summit coming up in a couple of weeks and it's an AI-based summit. Now, when I speak to my speakers, I say, look, how do you normally run your talks? And they will tell me. And I say, look, I can share with you, I know this audience, what works really well is they like how to, and if you want to generate a load of leads on the back end, what I recommend you do is you you come with a template or a framework that you work through on the call with the live audience. And what always happens is people are saying, how do I get my hands on this? This is amazing. I want it because quite often we move quite fast. And then when they offer it at the end, as long as it's congruent and leads to where that what that offer is, then loads of people just flow into your email list as a result. So it creates a win for the speaker as well. On top of that, um, I give all my speakers the recording so they can use it, repurpose it. And some people are shocked by that. And it surprises me to this day that speakers are shocked that I'm giving them away their recording of the interview that they did. And I think it's really thinking about the, the speaker, uh, because if you can make that person look really good and you can serve and support those people, it's not just a, hey, one, one shot and I'm done. 
people like yourself, Melanie, and many other speakers are like, hey, how can we do something together? It's a, a longer term mindset, not a what can I get, get you in, get you out, move on to the next person. And I'd say like the biggest difference is being people centric and value based. And of course, having a longer term vision that this is a relationship that you're building, not just a cog in a wheel or a number, someone that you can use. Mm. I I have so much appreciation for you bringing that people focus versus number focus. And again, like we're not making anybody wrong here. There's different ways that people are built and there's different value systems and there's different priorities, right? And I am yeah. people focused as well. So so that's probably why we resonate. Um but what you're doing is you're figuring out a way to bring the value and the people part of it through your speakers, your guest experts, your audience, and you, right? And so it's not just a, a one-sided experience. And that's, I think, what's making your summit so special. And I think as you're thinking, as you're listening in now, um, you probably attended a virtual summit at some point. Maybe you've spoken at a virtual summit, and perhaps you're considering hosting a virtual summit. And so um, what I want you to think about is what is the moment that you're going to move from being the attendee or the um, speaker to hosting one? So, Jay, my question for you as I'm prompting our audience to kind of consider that for themselves is what is the moment someone should be considering running their own summit versus one of those other levels of participation? Yeah, good question. Now, there's a couple of groups of people that you get, I think, running virtual summits. The first group of people is people who already have an audience, they already have a network, and they can see that collaborating with other people that play at their level who have a network as well, where they can share each other's audiences, right? And that is mutually beneficial because that can accelerate growth through that collaborative approach, right? That's where I see one opportunity for people to run um, virtual summits if they're at that level. The other type of person that I think... Uh, benefits from a virtual summit is if someone has a small list and they do not have those connections and they do not um, have, uh, they're not able to fill their group programs by sending out an email to their email list. I see that the biggest challenge for most people is they don't have a quality audience. Mm. They And that if that's on social media, that's on social media or an email list. It doesn't matter where it is, but they do not have a quality audience that they have those relationships with. And so when they send out emails to with offers, then all they get is crickets, like they, or, or they get one or two people, but it's not enough to fill their program. So for me, those are the two stages that people operate out of. Now, should you run a virtual summit, even if you're at that stage? Well, the answer is it depends. Because to be fully transparent, I said earlier that I was given the bare bones of a strategy and I had to build the whole thing up like templates, frameworks. And I've learned through my mistakes and optimized my process to the point in which now I have templates for everything. So it makes it easier for me to spin up a summit in like four weeks as opposed to 10 to 12 weeks, which it took me in the beginning. Now, uh, it is a lot of work. So it really depends on where you're at in your business and what you're willing to do. The second thing I say is that I, I'm about what's the right strategy for you and for where you're at in business. Because I'm a I'm very extroverted. You might have been able to tell. I'm quite extroverted and I'm really good in a live environment. So for me, it comes very naturally to be on a stage. I used to be a professional DJ. Uh, I love speaking on stages. It's just, it's where, it's my home. But I appreciate for many other people that it's not the case. Now, the good news is in a virtual summit, you don't have to do it all live. You can also do it pre-recorded. So if you're the type of person that, isn't a live person, you can get your prep in, you can prime your questions and you can do things pre-recorded. So you do have options to do that. So those are a couple of different audiences and it, it really depends on you as a person. Does this strategy lend itself nicely to you, your personality type and where you're at 
in your business as well. Yeah, and and I would add, having hosted summits as well as events and <laughs> a podcast regularly, um, you, you want to be all in on it. This is not something, from my yeah. point of view, that you go, you know, I should do a virtual summit, and then you host it like the next week. <laughs> it, yeah, it, it's yeah. an event. It has a lot of moving parts, and I think if we're going to put something into it, you do want to go in with the intention of this is – this. You know, you're going to build community, you're going to build connections, you're going to build your list, you're going to hopefully nurture some potential leads. You're also, I think in a lot of ways, tell me if you see this differently, Jay, I think you're also creating a representation of your brand. And yeah. so you're when you create a good experience for everybody, you're actually creating a really great association with your brand. But if you're creating events that are kind of um, falling apart at the seams, so to speak, um, perhaps not such a good representation of your brand. Yeah, and I agree. And for me, I knew I had something that was good and I wanted to reach more people. That's why I put on summits and I wanted more people to experience my brand, what I stood for. Integrity is something that's really important to me. And I regularly kick speakers off if they don't do what they say they're going to do. Um but yeah, absolutely. You get to show the world what you stand for, who you are. And this is that piece that I was talking about before about intention behind the summit. Some people operate from a certain set of values and they do things one way. Well, I do it the other way. And the people that appreciate that and value that in themselves, well, they're normally attracted to me as well. I think one of the probably important things to ask uh, Melanie is like, why are virtual summits so powerful, mm. right? Because while you can build your email list, that is one thing, but we know that what we really need to build with people is trust. And what people don't often realize is I've had people like yourself on, I've had people like Neil Patel, and I've had like other amazing speakers speak on my stage. Now, if you knew nothing about me and you experienced me for the first time engaging with Melanie, you're going to make some assumptions. You're going to make some assumptions that, whoa, this guy plays in Melody's league. They're at the same <laughs> these are who he hangs around with. And so Melanie's clearly been very successful what she does. So there's certain, um, you get authority and credibility through association. And so when um, it's kind of like referral marketing, <laughs> that's what it's like. Melanie's like, yeah, I know Jay. He's an amazing guy. He stands for this. I'm speaking at his summit. And so naturally that's association. So the first reason that really people, um, that summits are so powerful is because you have that level of association. Mm -hmm. On top of that, the second reason that I'd really say is people come and spend a lot of time with you. And they used to say there's what, seven touch points uh, that you need in order to help build a strong enough relationship for people to buy. I think now online, I've seen some metrics. I think it's around 15. Well, what if somebody, and I've had summits that, I'm not saying you have to do it this way. I've had summits last 11 hours. Imagine if people come and spend 11 hours with you and give their most valuable asset, which is time. What do you think that's going to do for the level of trust and that relationship? It's going to be on another level. I mean, most people would love people to spend 11 hours consuming their content because they know how much of a difference it's going to make. And so those are some really good reasons why virtual summits are so powerful. I love that you brought that into the conversation. And that's true. And, and I call them authority platforms. You're positioning your authority. And, you know, I just want to go a little bit deeper with what you're talking about with the borrowing influence from other um, influential people in your market the other thing that I've seen happening with you and I know happens all the time is you, you start to um, create this ripple into the community of influencers because you start saying, okay, well, who do you know who could talk about this? And next thing you know, one expert's referring you to new experts. And so where you may be like the best kept secret or you know have a bit of invisibility going on in your business the next thing you know, you have introductions and you have a, a a whole new circle of influence that you're building around your business, around your network, because influential people love to introduce you to other influential people. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's absolutely true. And what's really powerful about that is we can talk money, we can talk numbers on leads, but actually what's been more powerful for me is the connections that I've made and been able to play with those people at those levels. And one of the interesting things, uh, interesting story, I I had a summit where this one particular summit, like the way you work it is there's normally like a 10 day promotional window before the summit. And what you ask is all of your speakers promote to their networks, promote to their email lists. And what was quite often happening in the early stages is that people weren't promoting. And what I would see people as, I'd almost see my speakers as like gods. And because many of them were highly, highly successful, some of them multiple seven, eight figure business owners sometimes, I felt this inferiority. And I felt like, I can't, I can't follow up with them and say, hey, are you going to do what you said you're going to do and promote? Now, integrity was something that I would claim to be really important to me. And I realized that whenever I get on the phone with speakers in those early days, I would say, yep, they need to have a minimum requirement of this to speak on my stage. And because I had breakdowns in my leadership in the way that I was leading the summit, I would put people on with slightly less than the list requirement. And so there was breakdowns in my integrity and I was getting really annoyed that these speakers weren't doing what they say they're gonna do, but then I felt inferior to them so I couldn't confront them. And what was happening is my list bills were suffering. I was getting a, a, a poor list build and then of course that affected sales as well. I really started to contemplate this and I just made the decision the next time I was like, you know what, when people don't do what they say they're going to do, I'm going to kick them off. And the only reason I wouldn't do that is because of fear I wouldn't be able to figure it out. I wouldn't be able to find another speaker or they might say something or whatever the thing is. And I acknowledge my own breakdown in myself of how I was showing up. And I was just like, I just refuse to put anyone on my stage that doesn't meet the criteria. And what was really cool is when I committed to that, that same summit, I kicked off five people, kicked off five speakers that were like in the week before the summit, one the night before. I replaced every single one of them. And what showed up for me is that when I show up in integrity and I lead in that way, people with integrity also know other people with integrity. So I could go out to my speakers and I could say, hey, you're doing what the hell you say you're going to do. Do you know anybody else who does what the hell they say you're going to do? And that summit I managed to get, I think it was something like, I can't remember exactly how my speakers, 21, but I had 18 promote out of the 21. The very next summit, this is how magical the way the universe works and mind works. I had 16 speakers on my summit and every single one promoted. And I didn't need to push them like I had in the past summits. And it really came down to how I was leading. And mm. because of that, I was able to um, get a reputation, I believe, as someone who does what they say they're going to do and create great summits. And so it's really powerful what you say about meeting other people as well who play at that level. Well, and you just gave a great example of what it's like when you establish a high standard and then lead from that place. And so many yeah. people, the reason their business doesn't work, whatever strategy we're talking about is they're not setting those standards and they're not leading from that standard and they're compromising their integrity, their values, whatever. And that is just such an exquisite example of how that plays out in real time. And like you set a higher expectation, you le live from that place, and then you attract people who also share that value system. So, wow, that was really powerful. Okay, I have to ask a quick question before we uh, start to wrap up, because I, I know that a lot of people think that they're going to be able to like run a summit and this is probably going to inspire some people. It's like, yeah, it's really time that I step into this kind of authority platform. But I know there's like 101 potential mistakes that people could probably make. What do you see as one or two of the biggest mistakes that actually compromise the reach and the results that you can get from a virtual summit? 
Good question. So the things that compromise the reach and results that you get from a summit, that there's there's really two things that will affect or kill your summit. Number one is you put speakers on a stage that don't meet a certain criteria. That will be the first thing. And when I say criteria, I mean quality of speaker. That is important, but the objective of the summit fundamentally is to build a list, right? That If we're getting really raw and down to the basics of it, the purpose is to build a list. So they must meet a criteria and have a minimum list size. Now I'll go one step further and I'll, I want to find out what are their open rates, ideally what are their click-through rates on average, because I want an engaged audience, not just a vanity metric. Oh, they've got a list of 10,000. Okay, great. But no one ever engages. So I want people who've got engaged communities and networks, right? That's really important. So if you sacrifice on that, and let's just say you've committed to every single one of your speakers having a list of 5,000, if you start going, oh, I'm going to take someone who's 1,000 because, you know, I just need to fill my lineup or I like them as a speaker, then that will be the first thing that jeopardizes your list build and your ability to create reach. The second thing, and this is more of a personal thing, is that you will get in your own way because what will happen, as I've already demonstrated, is that speakers will not do what they say they're going to do or they won't, they'll forget things. They'll forget they're even promoting your your event. They'll like, they'll be breakdowns. Like they're human at the end of the day, despite what you might think. And the second thing that's going to get in the way is your ability to confront that which is uncomfortable. Because if they do not promote, and normally recommend at least two emails, if they do not promote, your list build will suffer. I promise you, I've done enough summits now. The patterns are very clear. If you don't do it, then your summit will suffer. I'll give you an example of this. I actually, um, someone came to me and they said, Jay, how are you doing this? Are you putting like thousands of people on an email list using virtual summits? And I said, um, I talked to them about the strategy and this was someone who was very experienced in the world of marketing. She'd been doing it for over 20 years. And she said, I want to build a virtual summit on this. I said, fantastic. Well, what I can do is I can mentor you and show you how to do it and I'll support you with it. And what happened is she'd got the speakers, but a few of those speakers she's got before I even came on board. But she didn't vet the speakers. Many of them didn't have the list size, which was a fit for the audience that the summit was serving. And then when it came to the promotion, many of them didn't promote. And the numbers, you know, I think she got about four or 500 leads, but compared to what she was expecting, she could have done three or four times that number if she'd have got the right speakers who met the criteria and actually did what they said they were going to do. So those are the kind of two reasons. I'll give you one more as a bonus. The, the third thing that affects the performance is having a summit that's too broad. Mm. Yes. If you if you're trying to solve multiple different problems on a summit, then your attendance and your conversion rate of people who will come into your summit will suffer. So I'm I'd glad you brought that up. Three. Yeah, I would agree with you. Specificity is a powerful sales uh, tool these days. So I I think the more specific we can be, the more um, first of all, the better leads come into the the funnel, the better. Uh, you know, the conversations are, it's just like, everything just seems to work better. Yeah. So, well, well, I can't, I can't say that word. So uh, <laughs> I, I always say, I was trying to say it and it sounds like specificity. <laughs> <laughs> well, I practice it, Jay, all the time. I say it all the time. So I've mastered it now. <laughs> um, I know you've got a great resource that can help someone who's considering hosting their own virtual summit this year, would you share what it is and how they could get it today? And also just know as you're listening and we'll link it up uh, below in the show notes as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, I've put together a, a free masterclass, which is going to show you how to add a thousand to 1500 leads to your 
email list using virtual summits. Now, this is not your traditional masterclass of let me give you the what and the why and none of the how. I actually dig in into a lot of the how because it was with a live audience. And that's what I like to really lead with, like massive value. Now, on mm -hmm. top of that, I'm going to give you a little bonus because here's where people come unstuck. As Melanie mentioned, AI is something that I'm big on and using AI and many different elements of my business is really important. And so I realized that many people were struggling to come up with a theme. What do I make the summit on? What's the promise of the summit? What are some of the topics that I would get speakers to talk about? So I, I created a useful tool called a GPT. And if you're not familiar with that, you'll probably find out what it is in the next 12 months for sure. It's basically a, a custom bot which will walk you through building out your first summit or at least the strategy side. Now, this is based on my experience and my knowledge. I've poured everything into it. It's not something that's just scraped off the internet. Um, it's based on my knowledge. So you can use that and it's free for you to use. The only condition is you need to be using a chat GP tool chat gpt4 or plus as it's now called um at this moment in time that might change when you're listening to this next time <laughs> but that's what it's called at the minute and basically a paid plan in order to be able to use that so i'll uh, include that in that link as well you just need to go to jwilliamscoaching.com forward slash leads and you'll be able to download that that gpt is sounding pretty sexy there <laughs> what a what a great resource to add to it jay thank you so much and so uh as you all know uh ai and chat gpt can be a great tool in helping you with your creativity boosting so that is quite a resource head over to jwilliamscoaching.com forward slash leads and as i mentioned we will link this up in the show notes so wherever you're listening to it you can just go scroll down to where it says resources and it'll be linked up for you right there. So Jay, this is the moment in the conversation that I like to ask you a couple of fun questions and help our audience get to know you a little bit better. Although you've already shared a lot of generous insights into your process. Um, what would you say, looking back to the beginning of when you started your business was the boldest thing that you did that ended up amplifying the success of your business? Ooh, juicy. <laughs> I, I've been in business over 10 years now, and I I fluttered around. <laughs> I've done, I've built e-commerce stores, I've built agencies, I've done affiliate marketing. But I'd probably say um, the biggest thing for me really was leaning into my heart instead of listening to my head. Mm. And... What that meant is pursuing my coaching journey of what how I really wanted to impact people. Uh, I I resisted for a long time and I lent on doing the thing that's really safe. But for me personally, really getting that level, and I think the key word here is focus on the thing that is congruent with me and aligns with me and then aligning each and every piece of, piece of my marketing with that is probably what's made the biggest difference, that level of focus and alignment. Mm, I love that. And looking back to the beginning, what's one thing you wish you would have done sooner? Because now you know how much money, how much impact was going to come from it. What do I wish I'd have done sooner? I wish I'd have hired a coach. And this is going to sound strange given what I do. I wish I'd have hired a one-to-one -one coach specifically to work with me on my unconscious values and beliefs. Mm. And I say that I say that because I spent so much time trying to figure it out on my own, trying to, I can do this. I, you know, I can beat my blocks. I can beat my conditioning. I can do all of that. And so I spent, oh, I've spent tens, if not <laughs> probably hundred thousand on marketing and sales and training, thinking that that was the problem because I didn't want to 
really be honest and vulnerable and actually confront the thing that was real within myself. And um, I realize now that if I'd have dealt with what's going on in the inside, then everything that I wanted would have manifested probably a lot quicker and a lot bigger on the outside. <laughs> well, that is very well said. Um, it might make you uh, surprised to hear that 65% of our guests say something just like that. Um, wow, that, that they're The one thing they wish they would have done sooner was hire a coach. It's either their bold move that they invested more than they ever believed they could in it or that they wish they would have done sooner. So I think that just goes to show that really powerful, influential people recognize that there is value in being coached and it's an accelerator for them. So thank you for being another demonstration of that, Jay, and for bringing so many um, great insights and your wisdom and your vulnerability. So thank you. And as you're listening in, highly recommend highly recommend, even if you don't know if you're ready yet to start that virtual summit, go download the tool and the training that Jay is so generously offering with you today. Just follow the link in the resources section. Jay, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate you having me. Thanks for tuning in today, Amplifier. Be sure to join us right now in the Amplify Your Authority community at authorityamplifiers.com and I'll share my seven proven tips to be a highly paid expert that stands out in a crowded market. Plus, we're going to keep this conversation going and I want to hear from you how you're going to amplify your authority and make a greater impact. Before you go, please take a minute to give our show and our guests some love over on your favorite podcasting platform. Subscribe, rate, and review. Leave your full name and I'll spotlight you and your authority on social media. <laughs>